So, how you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Doing great. Yeah. Um, first time in 14 years you're in yeah. the States or just in California? Just in California. I mean, I, I went I came to New York. Was it just New York? Last year. Yeah. Yeah, just to do, again, a similar kind of thing with just one install, but with instrumental. And are you here still living in England, in Yorkshire? Yeah, or? yeah, still in Yorkshire. Is that where you grew up, in Yorkshire? Yeah, um, I was born in Wakefield, which um, is not particularly a big city, but it's a small city. Um, I, I've lived sort of around that area all my life, although I don't live in Wakefield now, but uh, only 30 miles away. <laughs> So it's nice. It's changed a lot. Uh, yeah, it has. Yeah, my hometown's not as nice as it used to be. But we live out in the countryside, so my hometown's not yeah. as nice as it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. So I moved. Uh, so, <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, previously you had just recently moved to a new place, so it's a much smaller. Yeah, place. basically I got divorced um, in 1992, and I had a, a nice house with a loft converted. Is that the Echo Observatory? That's true. And um, my ex-wife still lives there. <laughs> she got the house. Yeah, and the car and the kids and the furniture. And I just got out. <laughs> you got the new life. Yeah, I got the new life. So I guess I got the new life. But uh, um, I rent a place now, which is very small. I mean, it's a kitchen, one small room, and uh, I've got a bedroom, and I've got a store, and a bathroom. So, um, there's very little room for the studio, but it's kind of crowded to the room one lounge. But uh, for the two of us, we manage, although we start to find it difficult to store things, basically. You know, there's a pile of them on the floor and on the stairs. And What's in your studio these days? The same as before. I haven't bought anything before. Well, I bought that machine last month, actually. I finally got that after all this time. So I had a, a PCMF1 digital system for mixing on it. Which I bought when it was state of the art back in the 80s. But, uh, uh, because I sort of invested in that and I had lots of mixes on that system, I never bothered with that. It came out, but finally, the uh, system broke down beyond the repair, so I had to get a down machine. But basically, it's a 16 track reel to reel machine with a uh, 24 channel mixing desk and um, a couple of outboard events, delays, and reverbs. Keyboards. Uh, an Emacs series one Emacs. That's what the hard disk? No, no, it's just your basic. Yeah, simple for me. And um, an old DX7. Oh, yeah. Which I got when it was kind of yeah. state of the art again. Uh, it's vintage. I had also a mini Moog in a Yamaha CS7PM keyboard, which I sold when I went to Tokyo. Um, and I regret selling now. So uh, that was what used the two keyboards and uh, an Akai uh, MPC60 MIDI production center, which is kind of a drum machine sampler and sequencer in one box and a guitar. Uh, which guitar? Fender Strat? That's what you used to play. No, well, I did have a Fender Strat, but my main guitar in the Bebop Deluxe days, my main guitar was uh, originally a Gibson 345 stereo and then um, a Yamaha SG2000, which I played for a long time for the 80s. And since 1990, I think 1991, um, I've had a customer who's out in my company called Patrick Cable, which I still use as the name. So you have the drums, the guitars, the keyboards covered? Yeah. And what about your bass, or do you. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. I've got an, uh, an Eros bass, which. Um, it's, a, it's an old Japanese made bass which was very, very cheap when I bought it when it was new. Um, and it's kind of a copy of a, a hollow bodied, it's like a 335 or 345 Gibson chain. Um, and it's not particularly the you know, high specification, but it's a nice guitar for fun, so I use that. I had a, a nice professional bass guitar, an Aria Pro, which I put into a shop to sell before I went to Tokyo. I lived in Tokyo for a year. Uh, the guy said he would sell it for me and give me the money when I came back, along with some other equipment that I could put into sale because I needed the money. And what happened when I came back was the shop shop had gone bankrupt and uh, my equipment had disappeared and the money as well, so I lost over a thousand pounds of equipment in the process. So I just stick this old hero space. Yeah, keep it with your old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to buy it, it's rubbish, so <laughs> there's no point putting it in the shop. How's Ian doing? 
he's, he's okay, he's very, very busy. He's um, one of the guys who manages, I think, all the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Um, it's actually you know, an, an open air sculpture park, as the name suggests, uh, in Yorkshire, just outside Wakefield. Um, it's quite important uh, in the areas of sculpture because they do some very major exhibitions. And it was started by the guy who actually taught me fine art, it was my painting tutor when I was at art college. And my brother started working there on a part time basis, helping out in the, uh, the shop that's on the side of the sales, and postcards, <coughs> and souvenirs, and so on. And he's ended up being one of the uh, managers of the place now, so he's really tight and long ago. Still plays sides He does, yeah, but not so much as he would like, I think. The work takes a long time. He toured with you, I guess, so yeah. He did. The whiskey yeah, that yeah, that's right. Yeah, and there was a good friend of mine called Alan Quinn on base, and he was a guy from my team here who were working. Um, I think lost touch with this the process of the world. Yes, the other thing that the ex-wife gets is your friends. <laughs> and you find out they're not really your friends at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned painting. And yeah. You seem to be influenced. A lot of your titles are either surrealistic in tone, mm. or you mention alchemy a lot. Yeah. Um, Whichever you want to choose first. Why why alchemy? We'll go alphabetical. Um, what is okay. it about alchemy that draws you to it? One of my interests and passions over the years, uh, although it's taken different forms at different times, has been sort of a pursuit of uh, uh, esoteric knowledge. Is that too highfalutin way of putting it? Uh, I've been involved in different occult groups and different uh, studies of occultism that cover all kinds of disciplines um, through magic and alchemy, yeah, Rosicrucianism, Gnosticism, uh, even Virgin to the Eastern thing. At the moment, my, I don't know the taste is the right word I'd have used in this, but, but the thing I feel most comfortable with are the more uh, Buddhist-based philosophies. Um, but for a long while, I've got, I mean, I still have a huge collection of books dealing with the Western mystery tradition, and alchemy is a big part of that. And apart from just the actual philosophies involved in these things, the imagery that is part and parcel of, of all these, these different uh, studies has something that is very much akin to surrealism. There's a, a, a delving into the unconscious, um, sort of dredging up images from the depths of the mind, and things which have a, a resonance for, for everyone, they're not just... Uh, they can be interpreted in a very peculiar personal manner for each person looking at these things. But also they hit on some kind of resonance which, which seems to work for everyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what Jung would call them, you know, collective yeah. of cultures and so on and so forth. Um, so I found all that, you know, very, very much um, influential and inspirational and also uh, connected with things which were happening in my life and so on and so forth. And in alchemy particularly, the idea of turning very base things into something very um, pure. Uh, very yeah, yeah. Well, whereas a lot of people read the, the popular interpretation of alchemy, they think, well, it's a bunch of old guys back in the you know, medieval days trying to put lead into furnaces and have it come out as gold. And they were basically after wealth and fortune and so on. And which, you know, I guess, is some people think of it that way. Well, symbolic then, literally. But yeah, the, the idea is that there's a, there's, there's a process. And the, the, the basic material that this process is applied to is the self, the human self. And that by applying the process to the self, that some kind of refining goes on, some kind of... Uh, development which results in an end result which is of a much higher value than what we started out with. Um, as in alchemy where fire is often used as an image of, of refining and, and changing an element from one thing into another, I think also in human terms um, the day-to-day the, the -day experiences we have, particularly when they're rather distressing and uncomfortable uh, when things don't go quite the way we wanted, where we suffer, that kind of suffering 
is a kind of fire which actually refines the spirit and uh, gives it uh, insight and strength and so on and so forth to, to cope with life. And it's a universal thing. I mean, the imagery of alchemy is one way of portraying this. The Jungian um, thing about uh, making the person whole you know, uh, is another way. Um, the Buddhist thing about uh, you know achieving the one and losing the sense of duality, losing the ego. You know, so this is another way of expressing the same process. And in a way, you don't need to apply any of this terminology to it because if a person is open and sympathetic to what's happening in his life anyway, automatically these processes go on. There are wise people who have never read a book of philosophy, you know, so it's not necessary particularly to do it. For some of us, it, we need a bit of a kick and a spur, and these things can help. And they help to the